it's a little unusual, but I was thinking it's also a reminder that there is something that holds us together that is unique, something that no one else has, and that is the Spirit of God. We share the same Spirit. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we're going to do everything possible to keep the unity of the Spirit. And so thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, you're keeping the Spirit of the, the unity of the Spirit this morning. We are together, maybe not in the normal sense, but we are definitely together because the Spirit of God is in us and we are worshiping in spirit and in truth today. Um, so I've got a powerful reminder today of where our hope and where our strength comes from, and that is, of course, in Jesus Christ. And so let's go to John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to be talking about the first six verses this morning. Here goes. John writes, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them. To see if the spirit they have comes from God. There are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them but we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they don't listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So there were, verse 1, many false prophets. And I think we could safely agree there are, even today, many false prophets. You, your children, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, we are, all of us, exposed to some ideas that are false, to some philosophies and some theories about things that simply don't jibe with a biblical worldview, that don't match up with actual reality. And so the folks that John was writing, we've talked about this a little bit in this series, the folks that John was writing to were dealing with a particular philosophical viewpoint called Gnosticism. Gnosticism. The Gnostics believed that knowledge was salvation. That if you had the right secret hidden information, that would unlock levels of spiritual growth that other people had not yet experienced. You just needed to know the right things, this hidden knowledge. And one thing that was part of this hidden knowledge for the Gnostics was very simple. The body is bad, the spirit is good. The body, the material, bad, the spirit, good. Doesn't that almost have the ring of truth to it. I mean, it is so simple. It sounds so spiritual, so mystical. The body is bad. The spirit is good. In fact, it's interesting, kind of a new agey feel almost to it. It's kind of interesting. I was reading the other day that fewer Americans than ever, as a percentage, are Christians but more Americans than ever, as a percentage, are quote-unquote spiritual. So being spiritual without Jesus, that's a big thing these days. Well, we get back to the Gnostics. The spirit is good. The body is bad. That, that feels deep. It, it, it feels mystical, spiritual, and it contradicts the cornerstone of our faith. 
the reality that God became flesh. Jesus did not come from heaven to earth as a mere spirit. He came as a flesh and blood person. When Jesus, when Jesus was tired, he took a nap. When Jesus was hungry, he had dinner or he had a snack. When the Romans thrust a crown of thorns on his head, his skin broke open and Jesus bled because Jesus had a real flesh and blood body. But these enlightened teachers of Gnosticism, they tried to convince everyone that Jesus was never really exactly human, never really fully one of us. And John had to confront that head on. A little pause in the action here. Let me ask you guys a question. Is every spiritual truth of equal weight, of equal importance, is every question of doctrine or religious disagreement of equal importance? There's an answer to this question, and the answer is no. In fact, Paul wrote a whole chapter, Romans chapter 14, about how we can disagree about loads of things, even religious topics, and that is just fine. There was a Lutheran theologian who lived in the 1600s, gotta love this name, Rupertus Meldenius. And Rupertus Meldenius said this. You've probably heard this before, although you may not have heard that name. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Or sometimes translated, love. What a great idea. What a biblical idea that is. By the way, if you're looking for a name for your new pet, may I suggest Rupertus Meldenius? I think, you know, Rupertus Meldenius, come on in. You know, Rupertus Meldenius, get out of the neighbor's petunias. I think that would be, that would be a lot of fun. So, unity around the essentials. We're free to disagree with each other, have different opinions on the non-essentials, but whatever it is, we're going to show love to other people and to each other. We're going to proceed with charity. So faithful teachers are firm on the essentials, and they are forgiving on the small stuff. They're firm on the essentials. They're forgiving on the small stuff. So here's the big question that John puts to us in 1 John 4, 1 through 6. It has to do with the incarnation, with God putting on flesh, being born into the world, giving his body on Calvary's tree, and then on the third day, that physical body being raised from death to life. According to John, if you happen to run into a teacher that says, no, that didn't happen, then you know that teacher is not a trustworthy, not a trustworthy source of information about matters of faith. Why? It's pretty simple, really. Jesus is the foundation of our faith, so the historical identity of Jesus, that's a non-negotiable. That's not a minor matter for disciples. So Paul wrote to believers like us, and he said these words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. He said, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? Being the cornerstone. So, we are the house of God. We are part of the family of God, and we are built on a foundation of, of apostolic and prophetic teaching. We know this as the Bible, and the cornerstone of this, what holds it all together, it's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. So, 
When it comes to essential convictions about Jesus, maybe you're on U version this morning, or maybe you've got the bulletin in front of you, uh, you could write this down. I do not listen to quote unquote Christian teachers who deny biblical truth about Jesus. Right? That's what John's telling us. In verse 3, he says, you know, that person is not from God. Okay. Now, like if someone tells me, you know, if someone tells me the moon is made of blue cheese, I'm not going to give them a lot of credibility when it comes to pretty much any question of astronomy, right? If somebody comes to me and tells me that a McDonald's hamburger is better than a Whataburger, I'm really not going to give them a lot of credibility on any kind of culinary topic. And if someone comes to me and doesn't teach the truth about the incarnation of Jesus, I may be kind to them, I may listen in one sense, but I'm not giving any credibility to the sort of things that they are promoting. Now, interesting, I think as we read this, you know, 1 John, um, the readers of this were receiving this for the very first time time, which reminds us they were at, it's kind of interesting to think, because we usually think, I think, you know, first century people, huge advantage, so much closer to Jesus. Um, They were really at a a disadvantage. This is probably 50 years after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and they would not have had the New Testament as we know it, the complete New Testament in their hands. I mean, they're getting a piece of it right here. They didn't have the 27 books in the New Testament, which means it was a little bit easier in that day and age to have some confusion, to have some chaos about what are the core truths of the gospel. Now, they had John. Uh, Most everyone else who had been an eyewitness of Jesus had passed away. He's probably in his 80s at this point. Most everyone else had passed away, but John was an eyewitness. but, But they did not have this beautiful resource we have, the canon of the Bible. They had bits and pieces of it, letters floating around, gospels floating around. But we have a bit of an advantage in terms of do we know what the core doctrine is? Yes, we do. But they were struggling, particularly in this case, with these Gnostic teachers. Now, into the chaos, these Gnostic teachers would speak. And they were persuasive people. Um, The body is bad, they said. So obviously, God couldn't have put on a body. I mean, God can't be bad. So either Jesus wasn't really a human like us, or this guy named Jesus wasn't really God. Those were the two choices they offered. I mean, the resurrection, come on, it didn't happen, at least not literally, not physically, maybe in a spiritual sense, in a metaphysical sense, um, you know, maybe as a metaphor for rebirth, maybe an, an idea of resurrection means you become spiritually enlightened, sure, but a physical body walking out of a grave, no, no, that's what they taught. But since the truth about Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith, you know, we got to get this right, and John wants to make sure that we do. So disciples simply had to have unity around the conviction about Jesus in the midst of the Gnostic psycho babble of the first century New Agey enlightened teaching of these men and women. Our conviction is this. I believe that Jesus was an actual flesh and blood human being. Or verse 2, as John says, that he came in a real body. If you bumped into Jesus, you'd feel it. Someone would need to say, excuse me. If Jesus stepped on your toe, it would hurt. Um, So Jesus was a real flesh and blood person. And this is a foundational idea of our faith. He's not just an idea. He's not just a philosophy. He's not just... Uh, collective wisdom of the universe or something. He's a real person. So what, you may be asking. I mean, they had these, you know, Gnostic teachers running around the first century, but what about us? What's the relevance to me today? Well, I think there are a few important ways that the fact that Jesus was a flesh and blood human being is very powerful and important for us today. Like 
when you know that God became one of us, that he wrapped himself in this vulnerable human body that's killable, that's breakable, um, it, it reveals to you how much he loves you. That God would do that for humanity. You know, he could have stayed in the high rent district. Jesus could have stayed in heaven. There's no coronavirus in heaven. Jesus could have stayed up there where bad things don't happen. Jesus could have actually had every right to just wag his finger at people in the miserable, sin-fallen world that we are responsible for and said, you're getting what you deserve. That misery is what you've got coming to you, but he didn't do that. He was born to a virgin in a dirty stable in a village called Bethlehem because he loves people like us. I put this on your outline. His body means God's love. It represents that to us. I know God loves me because he put on flesh and blood and came from heaven to earth. Matthew talks about this or records this in Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and give birth and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is near. God in our neighborhood. That's how much he loves us. Now, does it matter, again, that Jesus was an actual person? Does it matter that he got you know, sores on his feet when he walked all day? Does it matter that... When he was working with Joseph in the carpenter shop, he shopped from time to time. He got splinters in his hands. It matters profoundly. Because Jesus didn't just say, God loves you. Jesus wasn't just a bumper sticker. God loves you. Jesus proved it by walking as one of us. And he also, beyond this, he gave us the very best vantage point possible for us to see God. The prophets talked about God. They told us a lot about God. The law given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the law revealed a lot about the holiness of God, about the will of God. But Jesus pulls back the curtain and lets us see the heart of God like no one had ever seen it before. His body means we have this revelation of who God is. So I know God more fully because God became a flesh and blood human being. Uh, Colossians, Paul is going to write this in Colossians 2 verse 9. He's going to say, for in Christ lives what? Lives all the fullness, 100% of God in a human body. Wow. So we know not only that God cares for us, but we actually know God better because he came to be near us and to show us how God treats people, how God prays, how God thinks, how God acts in all kinds of stressful situations. But personally, for me, for you, the body of Jesus, quite frankly, it's at the center of our story, of our redemption story. Um, A ghost, a spirit, an immaterial, ethereal being cannot be hung on a cross and killed. But Jesus was. His body means our forgiveness. I know that I am forgiven because he gave his body on the cross for me. Obviously, that is the message of of the entire New Testament. I mean, it is our story. It is our story. Hebrews 10.10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's our salvation. You are made right with God. You are sanctified. You are justified. You, because he died, you are forgiven. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. 
the fact that Jesus lived as a human being is not only, however, the key to the forgiveness of our past mistakes, but it is the cornerstone of our hope for the future. Remember that time Martha and Maria were mourning the death of their brother, Lazarus. Finally, Jesus showed up, John chapter 11, but late. The ladies kind of let him have it for that. I mean, they were a little bit ticked off. If you had only been here, if you had gotten here a little bit earlier, his death would have been avoided. You could have healed him. And remember what Jesus said to Martha there in John 11. He said, I, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I mean, that promise... I'm the resurrection. That promise became solid. It became something you can build a life on. And it became so much more than just a vague hope for Christians because he did it. His body died. His body came back. He walked out of that grave very much alive and well. And so this means... His body means, it means resurrection hope for us. I know there is life after death because the body of Jesus was raised. Luke chapter 24, 38 to 39. Let's be clear on this. He wasn't a spirit floating around, interacting with people after the resurrection. He had a physical body. Luke chapter 24, he said to them, he appears to his disciples, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So there may not be a bunch of Gnostic teachers running around these days in our churches, but we still need the truth that Jesus lived as an actual person in an actual human body. And while we don't have these teachers running around these days, we still have a lot of people running around believing in their own, let's say, favorite version of who Jesus is instead of the full version of who Jesus is. I mean, everybody, I think I can say this, maybe, let's say 99.999% of people like Jesus. Jesus is great. Jesus is love. Jesus is forgiving. Jesus, everybody, Jesus healed the sick and, and cared for the marginalized. People like Jesus. The world is cool with Jesus Just not the full Jesus. Not the complete Jesus. Ricky Bobby, Talladega Nights, <laughs> sacrilegious figure played by Will Ferrell. Y'all remember the favorite version of Ricky Bobby when he prayed? He prayed to the tiny baby infant Jesus. And when someone corrected him and said, you know, Jesus grew up. Jesus had a beard. Ricky, but that, Ricky Bobby said, but that's my favorite version of Jesus. People like their, their preferred version of Jesus. Their favorite snapshot of the Son of God. People like that. But people need the real Jesus, the flesh and blood, full-grown Jesus. And here's the thing. That Jesus requires a response from people. That Jesus demands a reckoning. That Jesus died for you on a cross. That Jesus made radical claims on the on the lives of human beings like us. That Jesus made radical promises for people like you and me. And so he demands a reckoning. So now, 
if Jesus is Lord to you this morning, this is going to go really quick, all right? So just hang with me for about a minute here. There are three pretty great promises or assurances that we have that we can tie into this morning. Uh, For those of us who are disciples of the real Jesus, keys to confident living, the first thing John tells us is, I have the Spirit living in me. I have the Spirit living in me who is greater than, that's the title of the sermon today, greater than anything I will face. Anything you're seeing on the news today, the Spirit living in you is greater than that. Anything you face, any challenge you face in your family, or we face as a nation or as a world, Jesus is greater, right? John says this in verse 4, in verse four there in chapter 4. He said, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one in you is greater than the one in the world. Second thing, I've already won the greatest battle. The greatest battle that you will ever have to face already won because of Jesus. Verse 4, the first part. You have already won a victory, John says. You've won your victory over sin. You've won your victory over death. And you are not working towards victory. You are not fighting for victory. The gospel says you're fighting from victory. It's over. Jesus planted a flag there at that empty tomb. And declared the war over. The important thing is you put your faith in that victory. You put your faith in the gospel. You give your life to Jesus Christ. And you live a life based out of that. Finally, you can know this. I like this one in verse 6. John says, we belong to God. I belong to God. Hey, disciple of Christ, you belong to God. I like that. So if you are a Christ follower, you can live with this confidence. It's not a sort of swagger that's based on on your income or on your talents or on your beauty or on your connections. It is a confidence that comes through koinonia, fellowship that we have with God and with each other. Because Jesus gave his life for us and raised from death to life for us. So this morning, if you want to live with this confidence, the invitation is to do that. We're going to worship here in just a second. Worship together. If you want to respond this morning, shoot me an email. If we're friends on Facebook, shoot me a message. Uh, Shoot a message to one of our staff members or one of our elders. Uh, They're going to gather tomorrow night, and we're going to gather tomorrow night, the elders and some of our staff, and we're going to pray over all of the all of the needs that come in this morning. So turn those in, and we will pray with you in spirit tomorrow night. If you have a question about your relationship with Jesus Christ, um, I would love to help you with that. We can have a conversation uh, about that. We can start that online, and hopefully in the near future, we can continue that person to person. Um, But I would invite you to give your life to Christ and claim what he won for you on the cross. Be baptized into Jesus, washing away your sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's worship now in the name of Jesus.